Okay, we are started. So uh, welcome everybody for joining our webinar, First Friday webinar. Today, um, we are talking about a subject that is on everyone's mind, but is a little bit difficult to understand sometimes, which is the interest rates um, in what uh, kind of what we think the forecast is going to look like for 2024. And we Parker, our normal co-host of today, uh, was very excited to share all the information, but unfortunately for me, um, or maybe unfortunately for you, uh, he has jury duty. I guess that's probably unfortunately for him. Correct. <laughs> but fortunately for all of us, we have a special guest to take Parker's place today, and that is Parker's um, father and business partner, Wendell Couch. So um, Wendell uh, is right there and he's going to introduce himself in just a minute. But th Wendell, thank you so much for stepping in while Parker is uh, finding out if he's going to be helping our justice system this week. Well, perfect. It's like kind of like the beauty and the beast. He's the beauty and you get the beast now. So well, we'll see about that. And Wendell, um, well, you're going to tell us in a minute, but I am curious, how long have you been in the in mortgage in industry? I made my I made my first mortgage loan in 1990, which was many years ago. And before that, I worked at the bank, you know, making regular kind of commercial and retail loans. But I made my first FHA mortgage loan in 1990. Still remember the customers. Wow. So uh, I don't know about you being the beast, but uh, I definitely could say you are the um, OG, right, for mortgage. Maybe. I've trained a lot <laughs> of people. There's probably 50 loan officers running around, you know, that I personally hired and trained. So we'll see. All right. Well, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to share uh, with our listeners today about what the forecast for 2024 is in our in your mind and based on data that you have. And then what that means for them when they're looking to buy or sell homes. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I hope you will all bear with me because it's usually Parker who is doing this and he's the expert here, but we've got this. Perfect. And I'm just going to do present the full screen. Okay. So can you see that, Wendell, the whole screen yep. right there? Yep. Great. Perfect. Okay. Well, here we go. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. And as usual, um, I'm Ashley Smith. I'm a realtor. I work with Keller Williams and their luxury division. Um, so we, I also work closely with my dad, who's this person up in the top left corner of the pictures. He's been in real estate for over 25 years, and he also helps to make sure that I can be the very best I can be to serve uh, my clients. And then for me, um, I, I really enjoy life and try to live it to the fullest. And that's what I hope I can help people through real estate do the same thing. Um, to determine what is important to them and their dreams and then help that make it happen through um, buying and selling properties. So I call myself a dream maker and that's why uh, our company is called Dream Smith because we're helping you to create your dreams. Parker is the one who's seeing if he's going to be in jury duty later on um, right now. But and I'm, I'm sorry, Wendell, I don't have a nice picture to put up of you here on the screen. So what I'm going to do actually is stop sharing the screen just for a second so everyone can see you again, nice and big. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, so we've been in the mortgage business a long, long time. Financial services, almost 40 years. I came out of college in 79 and went to work for First National Bank of Gainesville. So for any old Gainesville folks on the phone, they'll re they remember First National Bank days, Ray McCray, Richard Shockley. We were an army of young men and women who were taught by the best bankers, I think, in the whole world. Rich White, Dick Ballantyne, all the Gainesville who who bankers were all taught and, and raised at First National Bank. I went in the mortgage business because my first loan was so horrendously handled that I thought it can't be this hard. And then when I learned that you got commission for doing things versus just a salary, I said, well, I think I'm, I'm gonna sign up for that. So after nine years in banking, I went to work in the mortgage business and um, 
took to it like a duck out of water. Just loved it because it was a process. It helped people. You got homes. And I enjoyed making car loans and second mortgages. But something about a house just really spoke volumes to me that it, it almost it really did become a ministry where you can really change people's lives and make their dreams come true because it really does. If you look back at what we did nine years ago, loaning, uh, selling houses, Ashley, how much money and equity people have created, we really did change people's lives with a, with a home loan, much more than financing a new Trans Am <laughs> used sure. to back, back in the old days. But I, I, I progressed uh, into management, and my most recent was with a company that's no longer with us, Homestar, where I was the EVP of sales, uh, managing almost $2 billion a year in mortgage closings, 200 loan officers. And I brought Parker in the business about three and a half years ago. And as as you, most of you young, smart people know, you guys soon become the teacher. So it's been great working with him. And we're just teamed up and and try to just do the thing we do every day, which is close loans on time and give great service. So we, we've accomplished that. We're the couch home loan team. We're powered by Barrett Financial, a big company out of Arizona. It was actually bigger than the previous company we just left. So really had a good time. But, uh, you know, I just have a passion to not, when I got tortured on my first home loan, I swore to myself that I would never do that to people, that I would communicate, close on time. And and Parker, as you know, was a teacher like you were. So we, we try to teach, educate, and facilitate. So that's what we do every day. Great. Thanks so much for that introduction. And uh, it's always really fun to work alongside people who are very passionate about their jobs and about their work and about changing people's lives through the work that we do. So um, I'm I'm just really grateful that you guys are, are partners with me alongside this work. Um, for those of you watching, if you have any questions today, just stick them in the question box. I'll be monitoring that as best as I can. Um, Wendell's going to explain as much as he can um, the slides. It's very technical until we start getting more to the, what does this mean for you? Then we'll both be in there, but I'll be able to check the questions pretty often. Um, so let's get started. 2024 interest rate forecast. Everyone has been wondering, Wendell. Since uh, like last year, when the interest rates suddenly went up like two or three times in one week, uh, what is going to happen in 2024? So this is big stuff. And I know everybody's kind of forecasting in different ways, but we've got some data to share that I think will help people have a good idea of what likely will happen this year and how, how that impacts them. Yep. So... Um, this slide, Wendell, we're going to get started with this slide about core inflation. And I was wondering if you could kind of share what does this mean and what does this have to do with interest rates? This is probably the one most significant thing we need to understand. Because this is the, really the driving force behind what controls the rise in mortgage interest rates. Not to jump around, but I do want to say this. The interest rates that the the Fed funds interest rates, which I'll explain in just a second, has very little to do directly with mortgage rates. It is not what those are. And people, they will hear that the Fed has cut interest rates a half a point, and they expect our mortgage rates to fall a half a point. Many times at the first Fed cut rate, mortgage rates actually go up. Very complicated. Let me let me let me unwrap this for a second. What is inflation? Uh, my favorite on-the-road meal is the McDonald's Egg McMuffin, Egg White McMuffin. It has low calories. I don't do the, the little potato thing, and I'd usually get black coffee. For years and years, that was $4.79. I bought it the other day in Tampa when I was down there on some business. It was $9.72. So I have to take almost five more free post-tax dollars to buy the same thing that I bought two years ago for $4.79. That's inflation. It's rising cost. As the cost of material goes up, the price that you send to the consumer goes up. The problem is price increases necessarily don't equate to wage increases. That's the problem. 
that's why you're feeling like I my budget's a little I don't have as much money right now as I did. I wonder what happened. Nine dollars at McDonald's versus four dollars at McDonald's. And your pay raise was only a dollar. So that's inflation's rising prices. Rising prices. And if you if you have rising prices, people don't consume as much. When they don't, your dollar doesn't go as far then the investors won't invest in what really mortgages are. Inflation, when they talk about core inflation, it's these the goods and services that we use every day, refrigerator costs, food costs, labor costs. Those are the core items that make up the, uh, the core inflation model. Um, shelter expense is 44% of the core inflation price. If you look around right now at all the apartments going up and how much a one bedroom apartment I saw in Gainesville where the close to the square was $2200 for a one bedroom apartment if you look at if you look at that but the cost of the average home now is about $2900 a month so people are are in that $900 inflationary move there they're going we just can't afford it we can't afford gas we can't afford the groceries our wages didn't increase because as inflation goes up, people consume less. And as they consume less, then their pro the production goes down, profits go down, the dollar becomes more expensive. So the mortgages, let, actually, let me explain what a mortgage is not. A mortgage is not a loan. It's a loan because it has interest in time. It is a securitized Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, it's a it's a securitized instrument. That's why we ask people where they work, how much they make, who they owe. We have to we have to certify to the mortgage backed bond investor that we've asked those questions. They're investments. They're no different than a CD at a bank. They're no different than a treasury investment. So what happens is when a when an investor can get six percent for their money for ten years. You think they're going to top their money for 30 years at 6%? Nope. So what do what do they have to do? They have to make rates go up to make it attractive for people to buy, but then it shuts everything down because the price of the home gets too expensive. Mortgage rate increases are a direct elastic relationship to inflation. As the dollar becomes less valuable, because my dollar now takes $9 to buy the same breakfast that I spent $4 on, Two years ago, I have less dollars. So if I'm going to invest my dollars, I want to get the biggest return I can. And I'm not buying a 3% mortgage-backed security when I can get 6% for a 10-year treasury. And I want about 8% to make my dollar spread the furthest. So inflation is the killer of all things. Why did the Fed raise the interest rates? Let's talk about the Fed funds rates. If you go to your your bank Sorry. and the bank says that it has $50 million in, at cash assets, right? Mm -hmm. Guess what they don't have in the vault? <laughs> There's not $50, 50 million. million. Dollars. <laughs> There's something called a liquidity issue. So if someone comes in and the bank can't meet liquidity, they buy money overnight from the Federal Reserve. It's called the Fed funds rate. And then because, you know, when you open your checking account, they don't pay you much interest. They're buying your money cheap to loan out at a higher rate. But, but that's how that works. It's called deposits. But deposits never keep pace. The money they have in the bank never keeps pace with the demand for it. So the Federal Reserve, which is a bank where banks bank, it's the national, it's the federal bank. It loans them money on overnight Fed funds rates. So if if they want, when, when the Fed funds rate was zero, we had a zero Fed funds rate for a while, zero. Banks could borrow money from the Federal Reserve at zero or at 0 0.3. And guess what? They were borrowing all the money they could. They were loaning all the money they could at three and a half, four percent and people were buying, building, having a great wild west time. But then all of a sudden, Mr. Inflation reared his head. How do you slow inflation? You raise prices. How do you raise the cost of borrowing money? 
you raise the overnight Fed funds rate, the, the bank now spends more for its money, so it has to lend it not at 3%. If it borrows at 5.5%, which is where the Fed fund rate's been playing around at, you've got to lend it at 8% to make a profit. Well, a guy or a girl comes in for their business, like Ashley, let's say that you want to invest in a B and B, Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And three years ago, it was 3% at the bank, but now it's 8%. You go, well, I'll just wait. I'll hold off. Now, all of a sudden, you're not hiring painters. You're not hiring people to fix it up. The whole thing just constricts. So inflation is the biggest indicator of mortgage rates. Why is a Fed funds rate not a mortgage rate? It's not the same thing. It, a mortgage rate is a mortgage-backed security. Let's go to the next slide. And I know that's a lot of data, but it's just, you got to understand, because we get phone call after phone call. Heard the Fed cut rates today. Yeah, mortgage rates went up. Well, I'm calling a different company. Well, it has nothing to do with our company. It has to do with it, inflation. Has a, if you lower the cost that the banks are doing today, they're not going to lend all their money today. It'll take six months to lend money and for the rates to be lower. It just it takes a while. It's a big old boat that takes a long time to turn in the economic yes. world. Well, and I think that that was something else that you're probably going to share when we get to this slide here is just because the Fed is lowering their uh, rate doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, mortgage rates are going to are going to be able to balance out quite yet. And um, it would part of that be because of this lag effect that we also see? Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe could you explain a little bit about that? That's something I kind of see here on this chart. Like if the if the yellow line is actually where we are with the uh, um, inflation compared to last year, or um, yeah, compared to last year. So specifically with shelter costs, like uh, apartment renting that you were talking about, and then the so it looks like it's been going up and it's still kind of high in the sixes. Um, but then the blue line, it says it's a blended rent year over year change. So um, that's kind of if you're comparing literally to this time last year, or is it like blending it over this whole course of the year? And that's why that lag effect is there. What well, the, la the lag effect is a little it, it's a little bit too technical to go into that. But here, here's what happens. Um Years ago, when the Wii game came out, the Wii game was $299. It became the hottest gift, and Parker was about 12, so he wanted one. I ended up paying $600 for a Wii game, buying it from an 18-year-old kid out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who had bought five Wii games with holding them at $600, because I wanted my son to have a Wii game. So there's a point where you start rising prices, and people will still buy because of the demand, but there is a point where people stop. So when, when the Fed starts raising rates, it wants people to slow down. It wants prices to fall. It wants, it wants Macy's to put their dresses on sale at half price. Be, you know, the only, Louis Vuitton never discounts their stuff, so that, that, that's a whole other anomaly. That's a whole luxury item. But what they do is they start raising the prices of the cost of getting the money to rate, to slow down the demand. As you slow down demand, you decrease inflation. I'll tell you what, when McDonald's quit selling stuff at nine bucks, people quit buying it, they'll lower it back down to eight dollars. When, you know, think about gas when it got to four dollars. Mm -hmm. We didn't drive as much. We probably right. didn't go to Florida. Now that gas is cheaper, <laughs> you know it's funny. Four dollars was expensive, but three fifty nine—that's a deal. And all they've done is raise the Mendoza line up a little bit to to make more money. So these these little squiggly lines here are a little bit confusing because I tell you what, when the when the housing market turns back around and your shelter expense gets back in line, and these apartments can't get twenty two hundred dollars a month for the apartment because they're vacant. When you when you have no vacancy because people can't afford inventory for a house, why would you cut your rent if you owned an apartment building? Right. That kind of thing. So let's go to the next slide and play with that for a second. Okay, sure thing. The, the Fed wants the core inflation to be at two and a half. It got to 6.4, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. Which and, and the bad part was 
some of the stuff outside of the core inflation even got out of control. So, you know, right now we've been hearing inflation has slowed down. So the economy is great. Well, no, a gallon of milk's two dollars more than it was a year ago. How, how can it be great? And my wages went up for a dollar. How can I? I still can't afford it. We've seen the largest rise in credit card debt in the last not 18 months than we have in the last 15 years. You know why? People just can't make it. Mm. Well, now when inflation is cool, which means prices begin to fall, uh, and you'll you'll see this, you'll see this in equity. The Fed has always liked to see a two and a half percent, less than three percent inflation. We had zero inflation for what, eight years, nine years? recently before this started rising so we had zero percent inflation for eight or nine years we did we had we had wow. close to zero percent inflation that that's what got us on trouble like one point some places had none so what the fed did and i think covid messed that up a little bit what what we did to keep the economy from shutting down we lowered mortgage rates right and mm -hmm. things got cheaper. Restaurants were, I mean, it was a mess. I'll give you an example. People come to us every day. You know what they say? I'm going to wait for rates to get back down to three. Not going to happen. Here's what happened. You know what the average rate, if you take out the low artificial years, you know what the average mortgage rate's been since 72? 7%. 7%. Oh, right. 7%. That's what I guessed too. I tell people when we can, if you can count your mortgage on one hand, you better take it. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Cause that means you're in line. Great. Here's, um, a, I, here's an example I like to use. Let's say that a farmer sells tomatoes and he's the most successful tomato seller in the world. And all of a sudden no one eats tomatoes because the skin's bad for you or something. And he doesn't want the people at church to know that his tomato business is going bad. So guess what he does? He buys his own tomatoes. He becomes his own biggest customer because he wants to keep up the front. Guess what the guess what the government did? Mortgage backed securities. They bought their own securities at a discounted price to profit. They became the biggest, they became their own biggest customer. And then they decided to quantitative easing and not buy. The mortgage-backed securities, and they're dumping out, and the investors are going. I'm not. I don't want to buy a three percent security. Why would I do that? I can get six percent. I can get five percent CD now. So they've had to raise the rates up to make the bond investment, which is what a mortgage is, more attractive. We are in a normal. We're about to enter a normalized rate environment. Five point eight seven five six six and a quarter. If you're out there and you're waiting for three ain't gonna happen if it happens i don't want it to happen it should have never happened to begin with to be honest with you let's go next question i'm sorry get passionate about no, that it's okay i love your passion it's really it's really interesting to learn from you and hear uh especially about the history that impacts all these all these things that's happening to us so um well talking about that we're probably not going to get ever back to a three percent mortgage rate again but um, and again, since inflation is what is driving mortgage rates, uh, can you maybe talk a little bit through this chart for us, Wendell? Yeah, it, it talks about what the what the Fed's target is in December of twenty three to have the core uh, PCE of two point eight seven percent, which is the core pricing, and the Fed's target is two percent. It just wants. It wants to get its numbers down to here so the inflation will be 3% or less. This is just this whole this whole model that the Fed uses called the Keynesian economic model. It was it was popular in the 50s. It was a, a monetary mod thing. The Federal Reserve, which grew out of the Great Depression, which is monitored by no one, it's the only government agency that's not appointed by anyone. Uh, that well, the Fed chairman is by the government, but it has no supervision and it's never been audited. So it is kind of like that big money conspiracy thing that we always hear about. But the Fed controls the rates, which controls the economy. And back when Greenspan was in control and he warned of a housing bubble that came true in 08 and 09 and 10, he thought people were buying. We had way too much 
we had way too too little buyers and way too much inventory. Now we have way too little inventory and not and way too many buyers. We have the biggest buying population today we've ever had in history and the lowest inventory we've had in, in 20 years, which is kind of interesting. So the Fed, they're, some people think it's antiquated. Their way of fighting it is to crash the economy by raising rates so high that people quit buying. And what that does, it kills overtime, it kills job raises, it kills higher expansion. One of the reasons that rates went down a few days ago, they're up a little bit, went down a few days ago, is because the job numbers was was less than expected. Instead of 155,000 jobs, 100,200 jobs, which means that the economy's not growing, which means inflation's not growing, which means the Fed's policy's working. That's why the mortgage rates fell again, because things will get cheaper because inflation is getting back under control. Okay. And so this um, gold box here in May, June, and July was kind of where we had been talking about possibly those those numbers will get to the lowest of the year around that time when the Fed meets at the end of July or mid-September. And that's uh, the Fed is now neutral in their rate cuts. More of the Fed members just voted to stay neutral and not raise rates. Uh, again, when you start seeing the Federal Reserve rates cut, this probably, if the Federal Reserve rates quell inflation, mortgage rates will fall. If if the Federal Reserve lowers the rate, but inflation stays higher, because I believe one thing that we haven't really talked about, I think COVID locked down our demand for things, vacations. I think a lot of us stayed home. I know I don't spend near as much money on clothes anymore because I don't go to the office anymore. I don't eat out anymore. I mean, I don't, I'm not spending that $12 for lunch, which is fun and good. But, you know, we all stay home kind of now because we do the Zoom calls and everything. So I believe that we had a perfect storm, but they attacked it the only way they knew how. And they almost drove us into a deep recession. It, it feels like now everybody says we're going to miss the recession and have a little bit of a softer landing. Because that really speaks to the core strength of the economy. There's so much money that wants to come into the economy that's been pent up. It's kind of scary. So there's a big debate on whether they're doing it the correct way, but it seems to be working a little bit. It's been painful, hasn't it? Yes. I mean, it looks, yes. I know, because people are like, I'm waiting for rates to go to three. Okay, me too, but they're not. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think the um, key there is instead of thinking what I'm wa waiting on a rate to go to is what can my family and I afford as far as a mortgage payment goes, and then we can we can backwards engineer what that payment or what that price of a home would look like, and then let's let's start looking for that perfect home in that price range. And if you can't find your perfect home, then yeah, let's wait a little bit longer for the rates to go down and keep backwards engineering it. But um, otherwise, to your point, there's going to be a lot of families that really do miss out on um, growing their own wealth um, as as individuals, as well as taking those next steps towards their towards their family's dreams. Let me ask you this question: As a, a great realtor, and she is a great realtor, everybody. So we'll brag on you for a second. Um, what's going to go up more, the house that I stretch in a up and coming swim tennis? Beautiful subdivision at 450 to 475, or holding on to my little um, starter home, putting 40 grand into it. Which is a better investment? I think it's the 450. <laughs> nice subdivision. The little house is going to stop at a point. You won't get your money out of it. People That's... are making a mistake by putting the 40,000 into their starter home because they think that that next jump's too big. Remember in the old days, we used to jump 50,000 and get a really nicer house. Or we used to yes. jump 75,000. We got the extra bedroom, better school district. Now you kind of got to jump 250,000. Mm -hmm. But your appreciation of that is going to be greater. And here, you know, everybody lives, at, I call it the grocery store effect. They live on what they can afford and still go to the grocery store and have a vacation, eat out occasionally and all that kind of stuff. But what, they, what they're missing the boat on is they've piled up consumer debt. 
and they they think the rates they think they shouldn't they shouldn't replace their three percent rate with a new home purchase of six or six and a half or seven percent when they really ought to be selling that house buying their life back with the equity they did nothing for but show up and make their payments on time for the last nine years that's all they did was show up and make your payments on time and good faith and God and blessing gave us all this equity growth that we haven't seen before but if they'll do that go back and put five percent down on a new house pay all their consumer debt off and buy their life back. You can buy your life back, but you can waste money putting too much money in a home that's not going to get your money out of. You know, actually, so many times we have people go, well, I just put a $20,000 kitchen in my 1,600-square-foot house. Okay, why would you do that? Well, because I want it to look like that house I can't afford. Well, I know, but you'll never get your money out of that kitchen, right? You won't. It's just the market won't support that kind of over over improvement. Anyway. It's so true. And I think for a very small subset of people doing something like that makes a lot of sense, especially if you don't plan to move or update or upgrade um, for a number of years and you just really want to enjoy that kitchen, right? But if you are doing it because you hope to make something out of it in a shorter period of time, then that's usually not the right move. So, you know, somebody um, like me that's uh, toward retirement age and got his house and, you know, I don't need anything else. I wouldn't be the one that, uh, even though I did spend 30000 when I bought the house five years ago and fixed the kitchen, but it was bought at a lower price. But these first time home buyers are in this starter homes. They need to buy their life back by selling, letting you sell their home, pay 150000 more for something new. Keep the cash flow the same because you paid off the two cars. You know, people in their late 30s and 40s, you know, two car payments, credit cards, private school, got all that stuff going on. I don't have all that stuff going on. I'm the one that should stay in my 1,200 square foot home if that's what I had, but not the young couple. They should go ahead and take their equity on that house you sold them six years ago and, and take, take the awful 6.5% rate, which is a great rate. It's really a, it really is a, it's really fine to have that interest rate when you fix the other things that, right. that relate to monthly payments. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about this, please send us a message, but, and also check our webinar from, I think two or three months ago, where we talked about what that could look like if you consolidate your debt so that your payments in your your overall payments for the month end up being the same or less, but you still are able to do exactly what Wendell's talking about and get to that next stage of your home journey. That appreciates more than the house. Yeah, exactly. So here's our here. Here's why we're voting on Fed cuts. It's not to make mortgage rates cheaper. It's to kill inflation, which makes mortgage rates cheaper because people are willing to invest in an instrument. Think, think about this. We all have investment thresholds, cash in the bank. That's the safest, lowest paying asset. Real uh, stock market, bond, bonds are next. Bonds are pretty dependable because you get a fixed yield. Then you play in the stock market and that goes up and down. When you see the market go down, mortgage rates go up typically because they, uh, uh, they don't have to induce a person into a safer instrument. When the stock market's rocking, a lot of times you see mortgage rates go up because the bond has to go up to bring people out of the stock market that's making 11%. Then you have the stock market. Of course, you can throw gold in there. That's another story. And of course, real estate's kind of a thing. So we all, the Fed is doing a good job um, inflation, I don't think, will cool quite as fast as they want it to because the demand's so high. But now at least there's in a neutral place. So we think instead of the quarter point cut, there's a 56% chance of a half a basis point cut. And what that will do eventually is lower prices, make the mortgage, make the mortgage-backed securities not have to be priced as high to attract the investor. You got to think of it as an investment. It's not mm -hmm. being... Fed funds rates, like we talked about, that's what banks borrow from the government overnight. That's which trickles down to make everything cheaper eventually. Uh, we see a we see a seventy five basis points cut 
about three months after that, if inflation stays under control, that's where you're going to start seeing your mid five rates again on your mortgages. That would be great. And and I think we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but we can talk about it now because um, we've already, we, this is really important people who are listening that as the mortgage rates drop, more and more buyers will enter the market. So these homes that are for sale for decent prices right now that you could actually afford at a higher, but a sustainable interest rate, mortgage interest rate, um, will their prices will go up. It'll be a lot like COVID all over again, where people are doing price wars, bidding wars. So um, just if you can afford the rates where they are now, and if this is the time you're looking to buy, then thinking about things like consolidating your debt, if you have that um, into and thinking about what is your overall cash flow for your household every month. Um, let's see if we can make that work now before you're competing against a bunch of other buyers and missing out on opportunities that are right there in the market for you now. Do you know how much $10,000 cost every month in a mortgage? $25? No, a little more than that, about $52. Okay. All right. That's so people, not bad. People come to us knowing two things. Ashley, how cheap can I get the house? And how cheap can I get the interest rate? I'm going, that's not what you need to look at. Can you pay full price for the house? Have the seller pay your closing costs? Use that six, 7,000 bucks to pay off consumer debt. Tell you a funny story. And I love stories because it helps you relate. We had a, a loan officer come in one time and said, I've got a customer stuck on $32 a month. They will not buy this house unless the payment's $32 a month cheaper. I said, wow. I said, that's short side. Nope, he won't. A month later came in. I asked her, how'd that customer end up? She said, you know what I did? I said, no. She said, I asked him for three months of his everyday checking account, and I highlighted every Starbucks payment. And it was it, he had spent almost $600 in three months on Starbucks. Oh. And I divided 600 by three and I looked him in the eye and said, if you missing a cup of coffee twice a week is not worth buying a house, I really have no interest in talking to you anymore. Mm -hmm. and I said, okay, you won. I see. So part of our job as educators, which is what, you know, Parker and I take that approach. We always sit down and go, Ashley, we're going to match your expectations with reality. I may only want you to put 5% down and pay off your car. I may want you to do a one time in my mortgage insurance charge. I may, our job is to, because all you understand, consumer, price of home and rate, that's what you generally understand. That's where we get the most question. How cheap can Ashley get you the house and how cheap can you get the rate? And those are important, but they're just the two parts of a 10 piece puzzle that you put together every time you, you help somebody. If you really are passionate like we are, in helping people understand. So this little uh, Fed dot plot, which is kind of a cool little name, it just talks about how many of the Fed guys are going to vote to do something. Their dots are votes. So and that's so, kind of and it looks like uh, based on that yellow highlighted section right here in 2024, that if, yep. this is a guess, but we're guessing that different members of the Fed on average will will um, vote for somewhere between 50 and 75 percent um, decrease point yep. 50 yep. and 0.75 decrease so you so that's why they're saying we think it's going to be 50 to 75 but there's, okay. there's not a three eights they don't go in eights like race two mm -hmm. but that's a good thing but again everybody if the if you gotta the banks have to be sure that that rate's going to stay there. It can't be just a bleep because of an unemployment number. Let's say you're running a community bank, your Peach State Bank, one of our great little local banks or, or the other great little local banks around here. And you're basing your loan rate on your deposit base, your CD rate, and how much you can borrow for the Fed. And you go out and say, okay, I got a 75 basis points decrease. I'm going to loan money for five years at 75 basis points cheaper. What if you make a mistake? What if that rate goes up the next year? You got to understand the banks buy tomatoes wholesale and sell them retail. That's how you know how all that works. 
So just because the Fed makes this aggressive cut doesn't mean that loan rates are going to go down automatically. It trickles down. It takes a little time and it especially takes a good while for the mortgage rates to follow. Inflation is the key. If you're sitting on the fence and we're and we're we're at six point four inflation and rates were eight and a half and we're down to three, four percent now, whatever it is, and rates have come down a little bit. It stands a reason that they get their core inflation at three, which is kind of a target 2.8 ish. And we're almost there. You're not going to see a 3% mortgage rate. I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm not saying it ever will, but this next cycle, I'll, I'll tell you what happened, Ashley. Talk about interest rates. During the uh, 2010, with all the foreclosures, the HUD foreclosure list to sales price was 62%. Wow. HUD listed property for sale and took 62 cents on the dollar of their own inventory. Wow. And what, and what was it when this got hot during COVID? What, 118% list to sell on some properties? Mm -hmm. And now it's back to what, 92%? That means that if a house is listed, I'm going to use 100,000. There's no house. But if it's 100, the seller is willing to take 92,000 uh, for it. But uh, back in the hot days, the COVID days, that Ashley called with the rates were up. They were wanting $118,000. There were bidding wars. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the craziest thing. So what's going to happen again, though, is because you've got to remember, we have more buyers in inventory. Back in the crash of 08 and 09, we had more inventory than buyers. But there is a shortage of inventory. So actually, if, if I were to list a $300,000 three-bedroom house in a subdivision today and advertise that the seller was paying closing, how quick would you have a contract on that? I mean, anything for anything under 400,000, that a, a lot of people can afford that. So probably very quickly, as long as the house is in good condition. Yep. See, but anyway, so the Fed, I'm, I'm glad the rates are going down. That means that their inflation is working. Their inflation number is going down. But you got to remember we're in a political year. It, it's, Ooh, it's the political year that really does make a difference. A lot of times with, not, with the best everything. way to get Best way to get reelected is to start a war. That's, that's been traditionally how people they'll they'll all of a sudden get concerned about things they weren't concerned about. There'll be a war. War has been more wars have started to get people reelected than you'd ever would believe. So who we'll pray that it doesn't happen. I definitely hope that that does not happen. I am curious, Wendell, and I actually I'll I'll make a comment on this slide real quick, and then I'll ask my question. Um, just for you who are looking at the slide right now, I just want to remind you that this is not a dot plot of mortgage interest rates. It is a dot plot of the federal interest rates, Fed's interest rates right now, and then the um, forecast or, or guesses of what how the Fed would vote to reduce or change those rates over time. So um, we're, as Wendell mentioned, we're we're probably not going to get back down to a three percent mortgage interest rates. Um, so speaking of wars, and hopefully we will not enter into one of those. But how do how do wars impact these things that we've been talking about? Inflation, um, the Fed's interest rates, and other factors that are really important to potential home buyers and home sellers. Well, since wars typically don't come to our shores. If we get into a war effort where we're producing things, it 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 puts people back to work. It puts money in the economy. People start buying. Sometimes it causes inflation, but it also most time causes economic growth because you're producing things. Yeah, you remember in the 30s when? Well, you don't remember. I don't remember. I was too one born. But in the 30s, <laughs> there was there was in the Roaring Twenties. It was the greatest economy we've ever had. And all of a sudden, it all fell down around our ears in the 30s. Mm -hmm. and, and it didn't recover till about 1940. And guess what happened in 1940? We started supporting our allies in war. Then we entered the war and built war machines. And we had VA loans. And we had people come out and veterans getting special benefits and subdivisions being built. And they just got going and going and going. And it caught back up in the sixties and seventies with, you know, with the inflation years and all that kind of stuff. So it, it just, we're in, we're in such a global environment now. I, I'm not, I'm not sure anybody really knows how to fix the economy. 
I know, uh, and this is not a political statement, I know he said, well, I'm going to go back to the Republican Trump days. Well, we had an $8 trillion deficit in because we pumped so much money supply in. And then you go back to where we are now where inflation got to 8%. It, it, is a, it is the most complicated, delicate balance of anything in the world of how all this money stuff works. But the, what we're hoping for now is for rates to normalize in that 5.7, 5.875. Your grandma's going to get 3% on her CD. She's going to be able to have your little, you know, give your Christmas money like she likes to do because she hadn't because she hadn't got any CD money. I put a loan in, I put money in CD the other day at 5%. I'm going, oh, okay. I put a little money in 5%. That's good, good, safe thing. But that's too high. But that'll cool back down. We want a normalized market. The problem is we have an inventory shortage. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see that. Ashley, do you think for one minute there'll be a 30% decrease in uh, price of homes? No, absolutely not. Especially not where we live. And we know in our slide coming up what they anticipate the uh, uh, growth of homes to be. Mm -hmm. This I, I talked a minute ago on that last slide mm -hmm. where the Fed bought its own tomatoes. Yes. This one? And oh, yes. That one right there. Um, that one? Mm -hmm. The Fed outstanding balance sheet. They're trying to see how they shrunk their balance sheet since 22. Yes, I do. Right over I here. Yeah, you don't sell as much mortgage-backed securities because you raise the rates. That's what shrinks it right there. And look where it went up from 2020 to 2022. Show that uh, on the mm -hmm. cursor. Right here. Guess who, the, guess who the biggest customers were of those tomatoes? The tomato farmer. The federal government bought its own product. So now China. it's trying to sell it off so that these their it's own holdings good. can be back to a normal, more normal rate. Do you know Fannie Mae used to be a private company and the government took it over during the collapse and they won't give it back? It's making billions. Wow. Fannie Mae used to be a government sponsored entity, a GSE, but now it's a owned by us, just like FHA is owned by, by the taxpayer. It's making billions. There's a lot of wow. class action suits about the people that bought stock in Fannie Mae and lost everything. The government lost nothing because it took it over and now it won't give it back because it's supplementing about 30% of the Social Security. It's a big mess. It's just interesting. Wow, uh, that is interesting. Yep, keep going. All right. That just shows your balance sheet, the amounts of securities held. Mm -hmm. So this is that number just from that chart before kind of here about four mil four million or four trillion. Yeah. yeah four trillion, I think. Um yeah. and so now or billion, yeah, I think you're right. Uh and so before COVID it was kind of normal. And but now because they bought all their own tomatoes, it went it almost doubled. And so this is showing now, how now. they're selling them off over time. Because they bought their own tomatoes, but now it's free market. You know what's interesting? You go like, wait a minute, I can sell my tomato for a dollar and it's flying off the shelf. I can sell it for two dollars and fly off the shelf. I'll sell it for twelve dollars. Guess what happens at twelve dollars? Doesn't People fly stop off the shelf. buying it. That's right. And so there now it now it's people who look in this investment grid going cash, bonds, thing, and mortgages are bonds. They're, they're all tied to bonds. That's what it is. It's a, it's a long-term investment that lives an average of 10 years. So it's a, literally a 10-year bond price is a good indication of how mortgages are priced. It's just an investment vehicle. If you're an investor in the stock market, depending on your age, you're not all into high growth. You know, If you're younger, like Ashley, you might have more tolerance for risk. But in my age, a lot of my stuff's in a lower yield, safer thing because I don't want to lose the money that I, you know, saved to live on in retirement. So bonds are a safe investment because they're typically are so volatile in the market, but you have to price it. Mortgages are bonds. That's all they are. You, you got to think of them that way. It'll help mm -hmm. you understand why, why they're, they're priced like they are. All right, next. So fewer people currently, fewer investors are purchasing mortgages right now, which is why the rates are higher. So when the rates go higher, more people want to purchase them because they get a, a better return. Because inflation ate their value of their dollar up. 
and they have to get a better yield. Yes. And they neglect the 10 year, they neglect the 30 year mortgage because they can get the same, a little bit less price for a 10 year. Um, right. You know, fixed rate mortgages used to be cheaper than fixed rates. And that's called a, a, a yield yield curve inversion where the short term rates are as, as much as the long term rates. That hadn't fixed itself yet. I was noticing used go, that. Used to go in the bank in the old days and they put on, you know, six month CD, 4%, you know, one year CD, 5%. 24 month CD, 7%. That's because the yield curves were correct. That's what we need to get back to, but that's going, that's a slow turn. Mm. Cause the Titanic, um, I'm yeah. just glad the feds tomatoes don't go bad. Yeah. I hope not. We better <laughs> not. China, if China calls our debt due, um, we may be all living together and fishing in the lake every day for food. Who knows? Wow. Hopefully that won't happen. Um, we, may be living, we may be living in the matrix and just don't realize this. <laughs> <laughs> we could be. It's been fun, though. <laughs> They're doing a good job keeping us entertained. It's <laughs> true. They sure are. Yeah. So here we've talked about this in other um, webinars as well, that mortgage rate rates tend to decline when there is a recession. So. Uh, these gray bars, for those of you who are watching along, are recession periods. And the gold is kind of highlighting when the, those mortgage rates fell. Uh, what does this mean for us today, Wendell? Well, recession is when you have uh, falling prices and falling demand. Stagflation is when you have rising prices and falling demand. That's a bad thing to be. So when, when we finally get recessed, which is what the Fed's could have done to us. And luckily, I think we've avoided it. But when they raise rates to slow the economy down, all of a sudden, those mortgage-backed securities become a, a safer instrument. And so they're allowed, because the stock market's not doing well because we're in a recession, so mortgages become safer so you don't have to offer quite as high a price for them. So that's why mortgage rates go down. It's a very elastic relationship with risk and tolerance and return. Uh, the stock market's booming. You got to raise mortgage rates up to attract people to the market. If the stock market is recessed during a recession and not performing well, people will fly to safety, which is that hierarchy of investments that bonds the safer place to be. So they, so you don't have to pay as much for that. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's kind of a mm -hmm. it is. Recession. And what I'm recessions are good for mortgages. What I'm seeing here is. Uh, well, I think you've already talked about this. If inflation is going down over time, the Fed should lower their interest rates. Um, but the inflation going down is what would uh, trigger mortgage rates also going down. Because um, it makes your dollar worth more. Yes. You don't need as much of a yield to support your dollar because it's worth more now. So you're willing to take a safer investment, which makes mortgage rates go down. That's right. Then, because the Fed bought too many of their own tomatoes and now they're trying to sell them, aka the mortgage backed securities, um, those they're having to sell at a higher rate to attract these investors. And therefore, that at the moment is keeping the mortgage prices higher um, until they can offload more of those. Yeah, because the mortgage backs are the mortgages are free market. Even though the government owns Fannie Mae, they're free market. But when you have artificial demand because you're buying your own thing that creates the market. Now, now it's just a normal investment that people are looking at. I see. But see, the bad part is if you can, if the stock market's roaring and inventory of houses are up for or the cost of inventory is up 40 something percent, and it's only gone down six or 7% because the rate increase or 11% on average, that, Gas price that was four is still three, but that three is still a dollar higher than we can, can can live with. So that's why we have so many apartments going. Can you believe all the apartments that are being built and people? It's because they're the, the chasm is about eight or nine hundred dollars of affording your life, and and so they we'll just stay in an apartment. It's really tricky. Very I tricky. Know Parker, I... Parker lives in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. and guess what's in Austin? Tesla. Google, all the California companies. I overheard him talking to a customer the other day, the guy like, hey man, you know, 
I only got 160 starting pay out of college from Google. I was very disappointed. I was expecting 180, but I've settled for 160. And my wife, she's only making 140 at Tesla. I don't, and I'm going, y'all are making $310,000 out of college? Yeah. And I'm going, that's why, they, but they're, but guess what? They're the ones that can afford the $4,000 a month payment. Sure. And the three, my rent's 3,800. And, uh, you know, most I'm going for in a house is 45. He was a California guy. He talked like that. I'm going, mm -hmm. am I hearing this correct? I, it took me five years at the bank to make $10,000 a year back in the, back in the 80s. And I'm going, I, if I could ever make $300 a week, I'll be a rich man. And I remember saying that to my mom. And, and, and look at you now. You Do did. You did. It's a lot of hard work and it's de definitely, um, but the story that you're sharing about this couple from California is not the norm for the people right now. And so, yeah, I, I read an article recently about people are starting to look into like cohabitation or co-ownership yeah. of homes. Think about this, like in college and when you're in your twenties, it's normal to share a space with somebody and and split the rent or whatever. So now people are thinking about doing that with homes, which is an interesting idea as far as still being able to build equity and build wealth. But it's so dangerous at the same time when you don't have any kind of um, potentially real long-term relationship commitments there um, or even legal ways to handle it. But I think it's something that we're going to start looking at and seeing more of in the next year or two. While these while these mortgage rates are are high too high for young people to be able to afford homes, we had a young guy the other day because I got to talk to him and I was just come interested in the psyche of, of buying mentality, you know, because I've been in this so long. He bought a house. It was in Texas. Um, wasn't in Texas. It was Iowa. Had a finished basement. Okay, he purposely went for a finished basement. I said, "Why'd you do that?" He said, well, "That's where I'm going to live. I'm renting the top out." Right. So, and I'm making five hundred dollars a month getting a free place to live. Parker's right. brother bought a house a couple of years ago here in Gainesville. He rented one room downstairs, two bedrooms upstairs, was making five hundred a month, had no mortgage payment. So, so great. A, lot of, a lot of times actually, you know, people need to say, okay, if I'm a single person, I'm gonna buy a split bedroom or I'm gonna buy an accessory unit. Fannie Mae just changed his whole guidelines on accessory unit income, which Parker and you should probably talk about next because mm -hmm. you know, people that look for homes. Even in the luxury end of it, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a retired couple buying that million, nine, two million dollar lake property, it may not be a bad thing to have an accessory unit over the garage or maybe rent a room out in the basement to help you defer that cost. I mean, people are doing things now that they, we didn't see them, you know, doing what 10 years ago I did just because. So true. Things. So, yep. Um, well, and I'll just. Kind of in this, we've we've spoken about most of these things here already, but just as a, a wrap up for our webinar, um, the forecast that we're seeing based on the data and what we're hearing in the news is that by the end of the year, by quarter three, we should see that the 30-year fixed mortgage rates are between the mid fives to high six percent. Um just be, again, we just want to warn you that as the rates fall, once they're under 6%, it's going to bring more buyers to the market and that's going to raise prices even more. So think about what it could look like to purchase now and then refinance later. As Wendell said, marry the mortgage and date the rate. Is that right, yep. Wendell? Yep. Right. Somebody and, asked me today, said, when should I refinance? I said, well, if you're way, if you're, if we locked, I locked a person in today at six for the quarter discount point. Great. He said, when should I refinance with you? I said, you may not. Well, what if rates go down a half a point? And I said, well, if you want to take nine years to recoup the closing cost again, you, they're focusing on the wrong thing. Mm hmm it really is. We used to have a rule of thumb that was a 2% spread in interest rate decline. That's when houses were, you know, in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. Now, 1%. If you've got a $400,000 loan, don't, don't even think about refinancing unless rates go down one whole percent. You know, because you've got consumer debt, you've got, I told a guy today on the phone, I said, 
Do you have six months of savings in the bank? No. Do you have credit card debt? Yes. I said, so why do you want to get rid of all your cash, put 20% down? So we talked them into putting 10% down and guess how much his mortgage insurance was? $84 a month. Much better investment than getting rid of your 10% of your cash on a $400,000. The, 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 the spouse was on the phone. She just said, I can buy a car now. I said, yeah, y'all weren't thinking right. I had to change your, pros, your, your perspective. I know exactly what rates are going to do. You know what it is? They're going to go up, they're going to go down, or they're going to stay the same. That is so that you you just know it. I am. I'm an expert. The conventional <laughs> wisdom is this slide's valid. That yes. the, the rates want to be in this range because that means we've normalized inflation, and we've we've kept the rates at a point where people will invest in it. People aren't going to invest in a three percent mortgage-backed security. No, not when they get five percent at the bank. Who works? So you know they're going to go up, down, stay the same. Here's what you got to listen to, everybody. Rates have fallen. Inventory hasn't. People haven't come out of the woodwork to sell their first home yet because they they just still think rates are too high. Rates are going to be great at five and three quarters, five and a half, five point seven five, somewhere in that range. You're going to make this mistake. Think of this home as a train station and you're standing on the station and that home train's coming by and that home train's got five and a half written on it. I'm not getting on that train. I'm going to wait for the three and a half train. And all of a sudden they come on and say, there will never be a three and a half train. This was the cheapest train. And you jump off the platform and try to chase it. You can't catch it. It moves too fast. Mm -hmm. You should get on the train, and if the train gets cheaper, we'll refinance you. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to wait that 92% of list of sales price to go up to eight or 10 more percent, that's $32,000 on a $400,000 home. Your 2%, your 1% rate decrease on that loan is only going to save you about 180 bucks a month. You're making a mistake by waiting. You don't yes. understand the numbers. You need to let Ashley and I and, and Parker educate you on what it really means. Yeah. And, and the monthly payment's really important for most people to be thinking about what can I afford? Again, that's why we will backwards engineer what, what we can afford here. But the other things to keep in mind always are, are what's the what's the goal? Why are you buying a home? Are you buying the home so that you're building your wealth and um waiting for your home to appreciate that's great buy it or it was not going to appreciate zero dollars can't appreciate into anything so um the sooner that you can jump on that train uh the better as long as as long as that's something that you can afford and make work with your with your family's needs all right and, and, you know, part of what i would challenge people to do I guarantee you if you went through your bank statement or credit card statement and took out every reoccurring charges for guy you had and you you did a k-cup instead of starbucks i guarantee you and you looked at the interest rate and the tax advantage of a mortgage i guarantee you there's 250 to 300 dollars a month in your budget right now you didn't know you had and that that equates to about forty five thousand. anybody that's looking at a house right now we can show you how you can buy 50,000 more and never hurt yourself if you listen to us. Every time it works, every tax break. Actually, it's really funny. People say, I got back $10,000 on my tax return and they're normal workers, your know, normal job, W-2 people. And I'm going, why are you proud of that? You let the government have $10,000 of your money? Yeah, but you know, I got back 10. What'd you do with the money? Can you list everything that you spent the 10? Well, no, it just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. I said, so why wouldn't you try to figure with a good CPA how to get to a zero tax liability or zero tax refund and invest that $200 a month in something you can feel and touch, which is called a doorknob? Yes. <laughs> you know, love it. Many, I love that. Yeah. Anyway, that's value entry. Inventory is yeah. tight. Miss Realtor, what do you think? It's tight. <laughs> I'm out there every day trying to help find uh, more sellers and, you know, the same thing. They're, they're also like, okay, if I sell, 
where am I going to go? That's always a question we talk about. How are you going to, what are, what are you going to, what do you want? Are we going to be able to afford it based on selling it? And uh, once we can have a good conversation like that, we're able to get a majority of the people ready to sell. Um, so I'm doing my best to get that inventory number up a little bit, but there are definitely more buyers out there right now than there are people who have their, who are willing to sell. So, um, so just need to get buy that house if you got the chance before the prices go up too. If you've owned your house more, if you bought your house more than six years ago, you really need to do something I call next step. You need to let Ashley bring us on your listing appointment. We need to show you what your next financial step looks like. We need to challenge you to pay off those credit cards. Because really, at the end of the day, it's not what you bought your house for. It's your monthly cash flow. Come on. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in an art store on Hollywood Boulevard one time, and the painting was $2,000. I loved it. And the, I was on Rodeo Drive. had no business being there that day, probably. But the guy said, you should buy this painting. I said, well... I'm not sure the color scheme will quite match my, uh, he said, it's about the price, isn't it? I said, well, not really. He said, said, young man, I was, it was many years ago. He said, it's always the price. He said, you, you need love it. That's true. It's always the price. You guys that have consumer debt on a house you've owned nine years with unlocked equity, get off of your interest rate at 3%. Don't worry about that. Let us do a blended rate and see what you're really paying for your money. Let Ashley tell you what your house will appreciate. Look at what you can buy at that 450 range and watch the difference. It's, it's astronomical how much more money you'll make buying the right piece of property versus holding on for no reason. Now, older folks, they have a reason to hold on. They don't need anything better. They've, they've already raised all their kids. Their house is big now because they go to the kitchen, the one bedroom like I do. I'm like, I mean, I could live in half the house I live in now. But if you're if you're that young 40-year-old couple that bought that first home eight years ago, you need to let the professionals, you know, explain to you what you're doing wrong. Because you are doing a lot wrong because all you understand is price and payment. And we we know how to fix that worries for you. And we are very happy to do that for you. So we talked about this in a previous webinar, but, and that. Wendell has already mentioned it today as well, that back in um, the, in the early 10 years ago, there were more, fewer, we'll see, there were more homes available than there were um, homes being needed to be formed. So like people getting married, people having a baby and needing to move to their next home. There were more homes available. That's what this yellow line is like almost twice as much, twice as big as this black line. But now over the past many years, there have been more needs for people moving into new homes and there have been inventory. And that's what's um, contributed to the great prices that we've seen for sellers but it also can, and that's because there's a higher demand. And this is a reason why we don't anticipate a housing bubble like what did occur back in the earlier in the 2000s. Yeah, money got so cheap. I remember when I was at the bank on loan committee years ago, the bank approved a $4 million acquisition and development subdivision loan for a guy that showed 30,000 on his tax return. And I questioned it. I said, why would y'all loan a person like that money? Oh, you stay in the mortgage business. You don't understand. The dirt's going to go up so much. We're safe. Oh, duh. How'd that work out for you? So we're not in that environment anymore. But let me ask you, everybody, if you look at that black line in 2023 right there, mm -hmm. household formations versus completions, why mm -hmm. in what universe would you think the price for homes are going down? Right. People are lined up to buy the tomatoes. Why would the farmer cut the price? Right. If I saw that number, what would the farmer do, Ashley? Raise the price. Raise the price. To slow it down because he's got more people wanting to buy his tomatoes. Why would he sell them cheap? You're making a mistake by waiting. You're waiting from a lack of knowledge. Yeah. And for a lack of knowledge, men perish is what the Bible says. Yeah. If you don't, you, make, you will make a mistake by thinking you know what you don't know. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing. I'm going to try to riff off of your uh, metaphor for a minute too, 
Wendell, with this tomato situation. So, so I've got the tomato. I'm going to raise my price because I can, because these people need to buy it. Right. So I offload my tomato, which is my home or my homes that I own. But what that allows me to do now that you can't do because you're either not getting in the game or because you paid so much for my tomato is go and invest in other tomatoes or other crops and things. So this far, these people here are the ones who are having the opportunity as well to grow their wealth. And that's what we're talking about also. Like, don't wait because you have to be you have to be here in the yellow bar before you can have the opportunity to raise your prices and then move on and, and keep on investing in whether that's another piece of real estate, whether that's buying a second home, whether that's like just doing stuff that you've always really been interested in doing, starting a new business. You're you're not going to be able to have those opportunities if you don't take advantage of the market when you can. Yeah, and and if anybody believes they're waiting for the next real estate crash, how in the world are you going to have a real estate crash when that black line is so much bigger than the yellow line? Yeah, that's not going to happen. What I'm happened in sure. 2016? Look at there. Yes, it was very, uh, very close right there. Yep. So there were, and guess what would happen to prices in 2016? If you don't have much demand. Prices go some, down. We actually, we used to do open houses where we brought food on Tuesdays. And if we had a house that went off the market in less than 90 days, it was a miracle. Miracle. Wow. You know, now food. homes are selling. I've got a, I've got a house that we're about to put on the market in Alpharetta, Roswell area. And that neighborhood's average days on market is 14, but most of the home, and only because one of them took a while to sell, but most of them are selling in two, three, four days. Yep. And that's maybe the new norm until that lines balance up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my question is this, why would you buy right now? Because that black line is your safety net. When that gap closes, the more that gap closes, the less safe you are. But look how big that gap is right now. Mm -hmm. You can't make a mistake with a piece. The mistake you're making is not understanding your finances and not understanding how money works and not understanding the selling your curd. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be mean and I'm, I'm in the club. I'm the one that's keeping the market down. I won't sell my house. Thanks a lot, I, Wendell. I, yeah, I won't sell it because it does everything I want to do because I'm an empty nester. But those of you out there with your first home that won't sell it, but you're about to put 40000 in it, you're never going to get that money back. I promise you, you're not. The appraiser is not going to give it to you. We have people, I just put in better uh, granite than my neighbor. Okay, I spent 20000 my granite, and the neighbor only spent 6000 So my house must be worth 14000 more. No, it doesn't work that way. It's just the way it doesn't work. I just got an interest rate. Notice the rates went up again. See, the federal interest rates or the mortgage no, interest rates? rates? Because probably, okay. probably somebody, probably one job less was created in America last month or something. It's just mm -hmm. rates, rates don't know where they want to be. Mm -hmm. So if we're in a little bit of a dip right now. You better take advantage of it. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, I think that I'm just kind of looking through here that, that another just important thing that we want to talk about before we end today. And thank you so much again, Wendell, for being a guest on the, on this webinar, you've added so much color stories that are memorable that I hope will help everybody really understand economics around how our country works. And especially when it comes to buying and selling homes, uh, we do anticipate because of that black and yellow gold lines that we just saw a minute ago that this year in 2024, there will continue to be appreciation, four and a half to 5% uh, appreciation on average across the nation for homes. Again, buy your house, you're going to appreciate and or that home will appreciate your building equity into that home that you'll be able to put into other things. And we also anticipate that the there will be more people selling homes in uh 2024 um because the rates are going down so 
this is a this is a really fun year still. We still have questions and we're not sure what's going to happen. Like you mentioned with the potential wars, potential with the election. I guess we're going to have the election. It's not a potential election, but what could happen coming out of that? Um, and so there's a there's a lot of questions in the in the air, but the main thing that we know is that over time, owning real estate is what's going to help you win, um, what's going to help you grow your wealth. And also, uh, if you are one of those very many people right now who are in debt, uh, with credit cards, et cetera, because it's been so hard to live with the inflation over the past year or so, um, you definitely should talk to us so we can talk about how you can combine all of your debt into consolidate that all into one place and um, come out better in the end as well. I would say this one thing in, in, in the last words. Don't wait till you're ready to try to figure it all out. Figure it out now and know when you're going to be ready. Let us talk to you. Ashley and I would have no problem, Parker, talking to you. If you're only if you're six months out, that's fine with us. But let us be that resource for you to get you ready for the next step. Because the worst mistake in real estate you can make is an emotional decision. It's the worst mistake. You'll end up like buying that car you shouldn't have bought, you know, on the lot that day. Why don't you come in here? We can get you pre-approved even before you find a house. Then we can, yeah, you, Ashley can get us to you, us to you, Ashley, and we can know, you'll know exactly. Or if you have a listing, let us come sit down with you and play like you're selling the house tomorrow and look at your next step. Let us challenge your Starbucks habit. Let us challenge your credit card buying habit. Let us show you what selling your house could do as far as monthly cash flow. Let's worry about grocery store money, not, not what you think you can afford. There's a big difference because that guy was spending $600 for Starbucks in three months. He could afford $150 more a month in the house. Just didn't because he wanted to go to Starbucks and spend $600 in three months. You know, actually today, if people will let you negotiate closing costs in it instead of trying to beat people up on the price of homes, mm -hmm. we can get you 5.875 with a point discount today. So, thanks, thanks for letting an old man prattle for an hour and a half. I loved your prattling. <laughs> and uh, I seriously did. I, I learned a lot myself. I felt like it was like um, econ for dummies for me because I'm just like, I don't get it. But you made it really easy to understand. So thank you.